So thank you, Jan, and thank you all for coming on your lunch hour. Um, uh, it's great to talk to a group like this. I usually talk to academic groups or people in education, so I'll be curious to see what you make of all of this. But I'm, I've been informed I'm not here to tell you things that are relevant to what you do at Google. It's more about general interest in um, genetics and behavior. When I uh, started in graduate school in the early 70s, you might find it hard to believe it, it was dangerous to even talk about genetics. Psychology was so dominated by environmentalism the view that you are what you learn, that um, it was dangerous professionally and sometimes personally even to mention genetics. We were, the textbooks of the time, this is in the 1970s, would tell you if you look up schizophrenia, it would tell you that schizophrenia is caused by what your mother did to you in the first three years of life. And since then, you know, a mountain of evidence has convinced most, psych most scientists that genetics is a major factor in most aspects of behavior. And today I'd like to just because I, I want to leave time for questions, um, I'm going to focus on one aspect of behavior, school achievement, in part because this is a talk I gave at um, New Scientist Live on Saturday. So what do you think is responsible for uh, how well you did at school? So it's easy to think about tangible environmental factors like your parents, your teachers, your schools. But what I'd like to convince you is that something intangible DNA is the major factor responsible for differences between children in their performance at school. The environment's important too, but the way it works is very different from the way we thought it worked before we took genetics into account. Previous studies of the environment are confounded because things that run in families could run in families for reasons of nature, genetics, as well as nurture. But if you ignore the nature and assume everything's nurture, you make some very wrong conclusions about the environmental influences on behavior. And this is all a lot more <coughs> relevant and important now with the DNA revolution. So I think that'll probably interest you even more. And I'll try and get through the first part of my talk quickly in order to spend more time on the DNA revolution. So this is my book, Blueprint. I'm very sorry um, that Penguin didn't get it here in time. But I bet you it'll come right after my talk, Saad's Law. But um, uh, Penguin's usually very good at these things. The first half of the book is about genetics. Basically, how do we know genetics is so important? And what have we learned about the environment by studying it in genetically sensitive designs? And then also some of the implications of it. And as I say, instead of psychopathology, like psychiatric disorders, or personality, I'm going to just focus on one aspect of this huge area, school achievement. Then the second part of the talk is about, and the book, is about the DNA revolution, identifying specific DNA differences that account for differences in behavior. And that's what's going to change everything. So I, th I think it's very important that, it's the reason I wrote the book now, is to say we really have to discuss some of these things because they're happening now. So just to make sure we're on the same page, you know, it's a, genetics, heritability, these are difficult concepts for people to grasp, but when you ask people, how heritable is eye color? That is, how much does it do to inherited DNA differences? I've done these surveys, and people on average would say it's about 90% heritable. That means it's almost entirely due to inherited DNA differences. But when you turn to complex traits like weight, how heritable do you think weight is? And the pop if you do population surveys, probably not of groups as smart as this one, but people would say about 20%, 30%. They think there might be some genetic influence, but it's mostly environmental. But in fact, it's 70% heritable across a wide range of studies, including DNA studies. And that's really important because, you know, it means that the differences between people in this room, you all seem to be skinny, except for me. <laughs> um, the differences are substantial, but the major factor is inherited DNA differences which is really important in our society with fat blaming and, you know, fat shaming, the sorts of stuff that goes on. You know, to recognize people like me have a lot, they find it a lot easier to put on weight than you skinny people and a lot harder to lose weight. So when you turn to school achievement, though, people underestimate genetic influence even more. They think it's about maybe a little bit of genetic influence, but not much, because achievement is, is the means, the etymology of it is by dint of effort, as opposed to ability, which people say, oh, that's genetic. But in fact, 
school achievement, tested school achievement in English, in schools in England is about 60% heritable. Meaning 60% of the differences between kids in their tested school achievement is due to inherited DNA differences. And you can see how important it is to know that because we tend to assume it's all environmental. It's all due to what, how good a school you went to, how much your parents push you on this. But parents don't have nearly as much control as they think they do. So that's one of the messages I want to get to. The most misunderstood concept in genetics is heritability, these six syllables. Um, and so it's important just to spend a minute talking about it. We're only talking about what makes people different, why some of us are heavier than others, why some of us do better at school than others. Of our three billion base pairs of DNA in the double helix of DNA, 99, more than 99% of those DNA bases are the same for everybody. But 1% differs. And we're asked, the 99% is what makes us human, but the 1% is what makes us different genetically. So what we're asking is, to what extent does the 1% of DNA that differs between us make us different in traits like school achievement? We're only talking about describing what is rather than what could be. So we study like twins and adoptees and DNA in a representative English sample. But that only tells us about what is now, say in terms of weight. Given our genetic differences and our environmental differences now, how much do genetic differences make a difference? If you change the environment, if you study a popu different population in a different time, that would change. But that's a good descriptive statistic that is sensitive to the environment in which you study it. And we're only describing the normal range of variation. I'm just sure it's an issue you all face, that you can only talk about, you, you can't generalize beyond the sample that you've described. So, these samples that we study are maybe representative of 95% of the population, but they don't include, say, families where parents are abusing the kids because those people don't participate in studies. Nor does it include the genetic extremes of single gene mutations that are very severe and debilitating, but they're very, very rare. One in 100,000, one in 200,000. So if you have a sample of a few tens of thousands of people, you don't have those in the sample. And lastly, I want to emphasize we're talking about genetic influences. These are nudges, probabilistic propensities. They're not innate, they're not immutable, and they're not deterministic. So I, I have to whip through this, but um, um, those are, are really important points. And people, you scratch the surface of what people know about genetics, and they somehow think you're talking about innate, immutable influences, which is the case for single gene disorders, which is how most of us learn about genetics from Mendel. You know, there are thousands of single gene disorders. As I say, they're very rare. But if you have the gene on chromosome 4, the form of a gene called an allele for Huntington's disease, you will die from Huntington's. It's hardwired deterministic. It doesn't matter what your environment is or anything else. The problem is when we talk about complex traits, not just psychological traits, but most of the medical burden in society is caused by common disorders. And they're not caused by single genes. They're influenced genetically, but by many, many genes of small effect. That makes them probabilistic rather than deterministic. And that's a really difficult jump for people to make. So any one of the methods we use for 100 years to study the extent to which genetic influence is important is a sort of biological experiment where there are two types of twins, I'm sure you all know. One percent of all births are twins. One third of those are identical twins called monozygotic. It's a single zygote, that is a fertilized egg, that in, for reasons unknown in the first few days of life divides in two. And those are clones of one another. They're genetically identical if you sequence their DNA. So they're 100% alike genetically. The rest of the twins are like any brother and sister who happen to be born at the same time because their mother had two eggs um, in, in the womb at the time and were fertilized. So they share 50% of their genes. They're 50% similar. So you'd predict that any trait, say school achievement, that is influenced genetically, you'd have to predict identical twins will be more similar than fraternal twins. And you can use the extent to which that's true to estimate heritability. And uh, so when I came to England in 1994, I began the Twins Early Development Study, which is the world's largest study of development of twins. We started with about 15,000 pairs of twins, and we studied them 14 times through young adulthood, most recently at 22 years of age. And um, 
about 10,000 pairs continue to participate. Importantly, as I'll mention later, we also have DNA on them, so they led the way in terms of some of the DNA analyses I talk about. I was interested in studying things that hadn't been studied much before, like language development in the early child years, or behavior problems, which develop very early on and are highly heritable in early childhood, like attention deficit problems. But when they got to school, because I was interested in cognitive development, I really wanted to study um, kind of the business end of cognitive ability and that's school achievement. So this summarizes 15 years of work in the twins early development study. These are the heritability estimates based on identical and non-identical twin correlations um, across all the key stages, which key stage one at seven, going to nine to 12, 16 is GCSE, 18 is A levels. And you can see that the average heritability exceeds 60% at all ages, including the very first grade. You know, a lot of people would have expected that in first grade it's more, your performance is more a function of what your parents did. But it's actually just as much genetic as A-levels or GCSE. And in the behavioral sciences, explaining 5% of the variance is a very big deal. Explaining 60% of the variable, uh, variance, m meaning differences between people, is, sort of, is off the scale. So it's a huge effect. And, oops, my N got misplaced. It's not just the twin method. There's m many other methods that are used. If the twin method is like a biological experiment, the adoption method is like a social experiment. So family members share genes as well as environment, nature and nurture. For a we've known forever, everything runs in families. Parents who do well at school have kids who do well at school. For decades, people said, no problem, that's just nurture those parents provide a better environment for their kids. But when you start thinking about genetics, you say, well, but they share 50% of their genes. Could it be nature, not just nurture? The adoption design separates that by studying parents who are related genetically to their kids. These are birth parents who relinquish their kids for adoption at birth. And then, so they share nature, but not nurture. And then adoptive parents who adopt those kids early in life and share nurture, but not nature. So uh, the book also describes a study I've done for 40 years at the, uh, called the Colorado, Adopt Colorado Adoption Project, um, which is about uh, 250 families, adoptive families, where we had data on the birth parents, the adoptive parents, and the adopted kids longitudinally through adulthood, from infancy to adulthood. And this summarizes 20 years of research. The, um, we also had matched non-adoptive families who shared genes and environment with their kids. So general learning ability, which we call G, to avoid the word intelligence, which is just like a red flag to a bull for people. But there is this construct of general cognitive ability, which is one of the better m measured traits. So just don't have a knee-jerk reaction against it. Um, but what's been known for a long time is it runs in families. And that parents and their children increasingly resemble their, each other as the kids grow up. So that shows you it, the parent-offspring correlation when parents share genes and environment with their kids goes up to about 0.3-ish um, by late adolescence. So is it nature or nurture? For a very long time, it was assumed to be nurture. And it's not an unreasonable hypothesis. But if it's nurture, the, that is, the parents are giving the kids the environment they need to develop cognitively, you'd have to predict that the adoptive parents ought to be just about as similar to their adopted kids and the correlations are actually zero. So that suggests it's not nurture in the sense we've thought about it as systematic effects of the parents, say. Well then, is it really nature? Could it really be that these birth parents who don't share environment but share genes are correlated as much as parents who rear the kids? And the answer is yes. So it's a powerful demonstration of the importance of nature and the unimportance of nurture as we've defined it in terms of systematic effects of the family environment. <laughs> the environment's important because heritability is not 100%. It's more like 50% on average. But it's a very different sort of environment than we, anyone ever thought about from Freud onwards. So the first part of the book, and I'm whipping to the conclusions here because I want to get on to the molecular genetics. It talks about how do we know genetics is important and just how important are they. But then 
some of the most important findings are about the environment when you control for genetics. So the second big finding is this one I just alluded to, that the environmental effects are important, but they're not nature in, in the sense of systematic effects of the environment. Adoptive children, you know, a third of adoptive families adopt a second child and they're genetically unrelated to each other. They correlate zero. Whereas siblings who grow up together and share genes, they correlate substantially, you know, 0.2 for personality and 0.3 um, for, say, cognitive development. So we, for 30 years, people have been trying to find out what are these mysterious factors that make two kids in a family different from one another. And it could be lots of things, accidents, you know, or illnesses, or uh, different peers or the parents treating them differently. But after 30 years of research, no systematic factors have been found. And so I've come to the conclusion called the dark hypothesis that the effects are essentially idiosyncratic, stochastic, random, in a word, chance. So they're unsystematic. It could be like Bill Clinton in his bi biography talks about why did he go into politics and he says it's because when he was grow he, at 16 he shook JFK's hand. See that would be a good example of this. I mean that's not a systematic variable you could measure very well and maybe you know knowing Bill's history here you can't bet a lot on its veracity I suppose but um, that's the sort of thing you get these idiosyncratic experiences like why are you doing what you're doing? I know in my case it's all these chance sorts of events just little nudges in one direction or another that snowball. So um, that's what we think it's about. And the other third finding is what we, that's what we call non-shared environment. It's not environment shared by kids growing up in the same family, going to the same schools. The third finding is called the nature of nurture. It's the idea that what looks like systematic effects of the environment are actually mediated genetically. So, um, you know, correlations don't imply causation, right? Everyone knows that. But if you see a correlation, like I do once a week in the papers, parents do this and the kids are like that. So parents who read a lot to kids have kids who read better when they go to school. It's so hard to resist an environmental interpretation, but correlations don't imply causation. And if you start saying, what about genetics? It'll drive you mad because, you know, they share 50% of their genes. It could just be parents who read have kids who read, but more Increasingly, it's sort of the nature of nurture that the correlation goes in the opposite direction from the way we think it goes. Parents are responding to differences in their kids, which I really see as a grandparent with six kids. One grandchild does what I thought grandchildren are supposed to do. She'd let you read to her all day long. She loves words and reading. But then the first one I had, she didn't want to read. She wanted to, you know, kick a ball around. She wanted to be active. It almost would have been abusive. I said, no, you're a grandchild. I'm a grandparent. You sit there and I read to you. That's what you're supposed to do. But it doesn't. You know, we're responding to differences in the kids and that's as it should be. And also in education. We should be recognizing that kids differ. Try to minimize the weaknesses, maximize the strengths, which I'll try to get on to. Oops. So if you think, I know I went through this quickly, but if you look at these three things together, they lead to the title of the book, which I agree is provocative and misleading. But what, it, what I'm trying to say is that DNA is the major systematic force making us who we are as individuals. It's systematic in the sense, I try to emphasize that because the environment's important, but it's not systematic. And so what I'm saying to tie these together is if you were cloned, and your clone was reared obviously in a different woman prenatally, grew up in a different family with different parents, went to a different school, had different friends, had a different job. That, that clone would be very similar to who you are now. Not just in school achievement, but in personality and psychopathology. In fact, that clone would be as similar as identical twins reared together. So with school achievement, they correlate about 0.7, identical twins reared together. Re being reared apart doesn't make you any less similar. So can you see that that's talking about the importance of nature, the unimportance of the systematic family environment, and it's not just the hypothetical experiment. I don't know if you know who this is. No? Yeah. Um, we'll know in just a minute. This is Bobby who grew up in Long Island in a very wealthy family. He went to university in upstate New York, and on the first day, everyone's calling Bobby Eddie. Girls are coming up and giving a hug and a kiss, saying, oh, Eddie, it's so good to see you. So he'd think, psychology experiment, looking for the cameras. But then he met Eddie, 
And they quickly worked out they had the same birth date. They were adopted from the same adoption agency in New York. And um, the publicity that came from that led to the rare circumstance of a third identical <laughs> triplet. Because I told you that the zygote separates for reasons unknown. Sometimes one of those zygotes separates again. So these are clones of one another. They have the same DNA sequence. And the film, uh, this is a documentary film that won the Sundance Award last year called Three Identical Strangers, and it's available on streaming. And I really recommend it as a dramatic illustration of the points I'm trying to make. But it is just an anecdote and an illustration, and just watch the first half. The <laughs> second half is a very bad story, because did you think, why were they separated and didn't know about each other's existence? Why was one put in a lower class home, one in a middle class home, one in an upper class home? a nutty psychiatrist, who was actually out to prove nurture's important. He thought it was going to be a definitive experiment. Tr identical triplets, put one in a lower class family, one in a middle class family, one in an upper class family. They already had adopted another kid from the agency, so they knew what the parenting styles were like. So they made them as different as possible. And he was, he was a Freudian, you know, this is in the 50s, just assume the environment, it's all about nurture. But then when the results started coming out, he actually buried them, so they're under lock and key at Yale Medical School till 2066. Never been published, but this film exposes it. And there's probably at least half a dozen, if not more, um, identical twins who have been separated as a result of this. He was a psychiatrist to that adoption agency. Right, so it is just an anecdote, but behind it is systematic data on twins reared apart. I did a study in Sweden of over 100 pairs of identical <coughs> twins reared apart as well as other adoption designs like biological parents and their adopted away kids, adoptive siblings, biological siblings adopted apart, and increasingly DNA. You can use DNA itself in unrelated individuals to estimate heritability, but it would take too long to explain that now, but it's kind of the hot new thing. So they all converge on the conclusions that I mentioned. So I would have been, well, I will just mention implications of that research. And the main thing to emphasize is no necessary policy implications. This is an old-fashioned view that policy depends on values as well as knowledge. And I'm increasingly cynical about this, that better decisions are made with knowledge than without. More often, I think, if your data, your research, agrees with the values of the government, they'll use it. But it doesn't actually inform the policy very much. But here's the one thing that got quite a bit of attention in terms of schools. If you see what I, I've been talking about, can you see how this makes sense? Schools matter, but they don't make a difference. So schools matter a lot. They, um, kids have to learn basic skills of literacy and numeracy and enculturation. But they don't make a difference. Kids going to the same school aren't any more similar as if they, than if they had gone to different schools. Um, and Part of that's because 60% of the differences are genetic anyway. And the environmental effects are not systematic. So one quick fact that's important for you guys, because you look like you're at risk of childbearing age. <laughs> and you know how in England, it's, we have this crazy selective system for secondary schools. Parents spend hundreds of thousands of pounds to get their kid into a better school. Better school, why? Mostly based on Ofsted ratings of the schools. People don't ask about the effect size of the Ofsted ratings. So they cost about 10 grand each. You know, it's the really good ratings of schools. Atmosphere, teacher support, bullying, the whole schmear. But then they are the primary difference between schools in the league tables. So the question is, how much of the variance, how, many of, how much of the differences between kids and their GCSE scores is accounted for by Ofsted ratings of school quality? So some kids go to schools where they have very high ratings, and some go to schools where they have very low ratings. So heritability counts for 60%. Ofsted ratings account for 4%, which is not a noticeable difference. So you get these mean differences, but you've got to ask about the effect size, and the effect size is very small. If you correct for socioeconomic status, because kids aren't randomly assigned to schools, it goes down to 1%. That's not a difference you can even detect you know, with you know, your, your experience. You need very large samples and statistics to detect it. And then finally, what looks like systematic effects of schools um, are often genetic effects in disguise. So one quick example of this, 
is that you, you, you probably know that there's a big GCSE difference between kids in selective schools and non-selective schools. It's a whole grade difference. That's a correlation between going to a selective school and how well you do on GCSEs. But it's hard to avoid interpreting that environmentally. The selective schools have more resources, you know, better playing fields, probably maybe better teachers. Um, but it isn't. They're selecting for genetically influenced traits of school achievement and ability, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you select the kids who do the best at school and have the greatest ability, they're going to do the best at school and have the greatest ability. If you correct, you merely just correct GCSE scores for what the schools select on, earlier achievement and ability, there's no difference in performance. There's no added value of selective schools. Now, a lot of parents will say, but in their cups at least, well, I'm not just sending them there to get better school achievement. You know, they get better contacts. Half of the judges in the UK are from the 7% of selective schools. So maybe there is an access difference or whatever, but um, if you're really just thinking about achievement, the evidence is that it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference. Now, it might matter. There might be nicer places to be. I'm not even convinced of that. There's greater self-harming at these selective schools. My grandson, I got a lot of pressure because my, my son wanted to send his kid to one of these selective schools, merely 30,000 a year, when he had a perfectly good comprehensive. Um, and um, what was I going to say? Uh, well, I, just, I, I resisted that because I don't believe it makes a difference. Oh, yeah. And a kid like him, Tristram, no less, is a star in his school, the comprehensive elementary school. But when these kids get to these high-pressure selective schools, they're no longer a star. They're lucky to be kind of average. And so, and there's a lot of pressure, and they kick kids out if they don't do well on the pretests and stuff. I mean, it's a crazy, stressful system that I think destroys learning. So and the enjoyment of learning. So I think we need to think about education in a different way and thinking about it genetically. Most of what's going on is kids are selecting and modifying and creating environments in part correlated with their genetic propensities. So kids in the same classroom can experience different environments based on their genetic propensities. They just ask more questions. You know, they follow up on stuff. And um, I think we need to move from this passive model of imposed in, um, in instruction, which is the, you know, instruction is from Latin instruari to shove in, which is the way we think of it. We're shoving in this national curriculum in their head. Instead, we need to move to an active model of shaped environments in which kids select environments that are conducive, that are fitting with their propensities. You know, not everyone, this might be heresy here, but not everyone needs to know advanced math, for example. So we need to think about what kids are good at and maximize their strengths and minimize their weakness and mostly have them learn to learn because it's well known, I mean everybody says, I don't know if it's true, but that the kids in elementary school today are going to be doing jobs that don't exist now. They've got to learn to learn. It's not a matter of specific skills that they learn. They need to learn to learn and mostly they need to enjoy learning. But our test obsessed, high stakes testing culture is really destroying any sort of enjoyment of learning. Okay, I'll get off the soapbox. And I would be happy in my, that was 35 years of my research, and I would have been happy if it ended there, but then along came the DNA revolution. And as I say, I think it's gonna change everything. It'll allow us to predict from DNA alone problems and promise from birth, because your DNA doesn't change throughout life. And that allows us to move towards prevention. So rather than waiting until problems occur, like waiting till kids go to school and then they fail at reading, you can predict reading problems. And if you can predict them, you can prevent them. And prevention's got to be a better way to go. That's what, the way all of medicine is moving towards prevention. Don't wait till people have heart attacks because we're not very good at fixing things like that or obesity or alcoholism or schizophrenia. Let's predict who's got the problems, find out what those processes are and intervene to prevent the problems. And then um, it really is transforming science already. Almost all large studies now are including DNA. And it will transform society, parenting as well as education. I'm writing my next book on the genetics of parenting. And then um, how we understand ourselves. The, the end of the book, uh, has my, the first, world's first polygenic profile for psychological traits, and it's for me. And so I describe, what does it mean that I'm at the 94th percentile for BMI? 
people body mass index. People say, oh, then you're just going to give up, say you're a genetic fatty. But I know it's not the case for all of these problems. It's motivating to say, okay, I've got to work harder at it. I've got to change my environment to make it less easy for me to eat junk food, for example. So it's important to know about the DNA revolution, and that's what I'd like to talk about. But I don't have to worry about getting techy a little bit with you guys, I suppose. The first step is to get DNA. If you've done any direct-to-consumer testing, Ancestry.com, 23andMe, you spit in a tube. You can get DNA from any cell in your body. Because a remarkable thing, you may not have appreciated this before, you start life as a single cell, half the DNA from your mother, half from your father. That unique set of DNA is the same DNA in every cell in your body, trillions of cells. So you can get DNA from any cell in your body. Saliva actually doesn't have cells, but it does have cells that are sloughed off from inside your mouth. That's partly what saliva is doing. So you, all you need is one cell. You know, if you drink from a cup, MI5 can get your DNA because you leave a cell or so on the lip of the cup. So once you get DNA, then you genotype the DNA. And there's, as I say, only 1% of our DNA differs. The most common type of DNA difference is called a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. Polymorphism is just a difference. And a nucleotide, it refers to the bases of DNA. So you know the DNA code is written in a four-letter code of ACs, Ts, and Gs. So what this shows is your two chromosomes. And if you can see the little letters, you'll see that those two chromosomes have exactly the same nucleotide bases except for one. And that would be true for us. We 99% similar, 1% differs. And what we'll do is, so instead of having a C some, might, some people have a T. Those are called alleles, alternate forms of DNA. And once we get that difference, we can just simply correlate it with traits like academic achievement. They call it association in genetics, but it's just a correlation between whether you have one, zero, one, or two Cs, for example, in that. And here's the first one that was discovered using these new techniques that I'll describe. It was published in Science. In, um, it was discovered using this atheoretical approach that I'll describe in just a minute. But I just wanted to show you what a SNP looks like really. This is a SNP where we, humans all used to have TT at this one particular locus, spot on the chromosome. Then some guy had a mutation. DNA is incredibly reliable in its replication. But when you've got three billion base pairs of DNA, every time your cells divide, you're duplicating that. Once in a great while, you get a difference. So this guy had an A instead of a T. He could have had a C or a G but he had an A. Turns out it rapidly spread through human populations, especially in Europe where it originally developed, because it helps you uh, store body fat. And back in the Stone Age, that was a very good thing. But you can imagine now in a fast food nation, it's not such a good thing to be efficient at storing fat. And so now 40% of the population has an A allele. And if you have two A alleles, as I do, you ha you're six pounds heavier on average than people who have no A alleles, and then people with one A alleles in between. So that's what we mean by an association. It's literally a correlation between the zero, one, or two A, a alleles and the trait, in this case, body mass index, okay? Now the thing that's changed everything is a technological advance called a SNP chip. So this is a DNA array the size of a postage stamp that consists of synthesized short fragments of DNA that surround a particular SNP. And what the method is the same method we've always used to detect SNPs. You denature, you raise the temperature of DNA and it separates. And DNA doesn't like to be separated, it wants to find its mate. You chop it up, you put a fluorescent tag on those little fragments of DNA, and you wash them over this plate that has these probes, millions of probes, for SNPs. So if you, what this cartoon at the right-hand corner is showing you, if you have the right SNP, it will hybridize because DNA wants to hybridize. But if you have the wrong allele there, it won't be able to hybridize. So what you're left with then is fluorescence indicating whether or not you have that particular uh, allele. And if you have a strong signal, you can see in this array on the lower left, some of the bright dots are brighter than others. If it's dark, it means you didn't have any. If it's medium, it means you had one. And if it's very bright, you had two of that allele. And so you can study millions of these SNPs. 
this way and very cheaply. It started out with thousands of pounds for this and now it's, the real costs are more like 40 pounds. To do a whole millions of SNPs on this one little chip and it's very reliable. So it's an amazing technological advance that's really transformed the life sciences. So now instead of correlating one SNP with a trait, you can correlate millions of SNPs with a trait. And it's atheoretical. You don't just look at a few candidate genes like serotonin because you think it's important in depression, which was a dead end. Instead, you can take an atheoretical approach just saying, let's look at millions of SNPs across the genome and see if any of them are associated with the trait. That's called genome-wide association. And this is the thing that's changed my career. In the last year, there was a genome-wide association study published of educational attainment with over a million people. And the reason that's important is that they could detect very tiny differences. Early on, these studies weren't successful because they weren't powered to detect small effects. Everyone thought heritability is going to be due to a few genes of big effect. But we never found those. Instead, what you find in this study and throughout the life sciences is that above that line is genome-wide significance corrected for a million multiple testings, and each dot is a SNP. And SNPs close together on a chromosome are correlated with each other, therefore they should also be correlated with the trait. So these peaks suggest the most significant results, but the point is thousands of these SNPs are significantly associated with a trait, in this case educational attainment, which is merely years of education. And this is what's found throughout the life sciences. There are no big effects. That SNP I showed you for body mass index, people thought, well, it's just a tiny effect, 1% of the variance. Turns out it's one of the bigger effects. Most of the effects are very much smaller. So that's been a startling revelation. It means you need huge samples to detect these effects. But how are you going to use them then if there's so many tiny effects? If you want to study brain on gene brain behavior pathways, good luck, because these are such tiny effects, it's hard to see them. But I'm interested in predicting behavior, and you can do that by adding up these SNPs, just like you do add up, you add up items on a scale. And you have to get them in the right direction, and you weight them by the effect size of their association, just because a SNP like these account for more than some of these SNPs that are less associated. But it's just simply adding them up, and that's a polygenic score. And this is what's transforming everything, because they're 100% reliable, they're unbiased, they're cheap. But unlike any other predictor we have, you can predict just as well from birth as you can from later in life. And most of what we know about prevention in medicine as well as in psychiatry, even think of obesity, the, it's earlier preventions that work best, but we can't predict early, but we can now with DNA. And it's one of the few correlations that do imply causation in the limited sense that there's no reverse causation. You inherit your DNA sequence and nothing changes that. And before you ask me about epigenetics or gene expression, yeah, these SNPs have to be expressed, but if they're associated with a trait like school achievement, they were expressed. We don't have to know anything about the pathways in between. And nothing in behavior, environment, or the brain changes your DNA sequence. So this is really happening. Um, people worried about this 10 years ago, but then direct-to-consumer companies like 23andMe, Ancestry.com came along, and 25 million people have voted with their checkbook to do this, to pay for it themselves. Mostly what you get are single gene disorders, and most people do it for ancestry, because it is fascinating. You might think you know your ancestry, but you don't. We're all mongrels, and we come from diverse parts of the world. And we have a lot of relatives out there we didn't know about. Um, some great stories, and I just see that BBC documentary last month about um, diblings, donor inseminated siblings who don't find out till they're 18. There's one father who's inseminated 65 kids, so they're actually half siblings who didn't know about each other. So it's a, it's a wild west out there. And what they're not doing yet is these polygenic scores, but that's the big thing now. They're all struggling to do it. A new company came up this week that's trying to sell polygenic scores. 23andMe won't do it because they were burned by FDA for reasons we can go into. So they allow you, if you do 23andMe, with one push of a button, you download all your genotypes. And these other companies, with one push of a button, you upload them, and then they give you these polygenic scores. And so the big news is, it's not announced yet, but it's really cool that the NHS, the government has just given 80 million pounds to make genotyping free on the NHS. 
So when you go to the hospital beginning next year and they take blood, you'll be asked, do you want to do this? And how much information do you want? And when they've done this in Finland and Estonia, they're oversubscribed right away. 85% of the people want to do it. Because in a way, it's so much better than direct-to-consumer companies. In terms of data um, confidentiality, for example, they're not going to sell it on to pharma, as 23andMe does, anonymously. And also, they won't, if you do 23andMe, and you're in the unlucky 1% of the population who has a two alleles for this recessive trait for Alzheimer's, you could find out you're at a 60% risk for having Alzheimer's. And, and what do you get from them? A link saying you might want to find out more about Alzheimer's. But there's nothing you can do about it. So if you had it with the NHS and you have NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, they could decide you can't do everything for everybody. There's some things you can't do anything about. So probably the, the standard procedure will be, do you want to just know the stuff that NHS thinks you ought to know about. Certainly heart attacks, because you can predict those from early in life and you can prevent heart attacks. Alcoholism, you know, it's not that good a polygenic score, but you cannot become alcoholic unless you drink a lot of alcohol for a long time. If you drink as much as your friends, they might not be at risk for alcoholism, but you might. So there are things like that that you might really want to know about. And this is 160 million are behind this if it works well with the first five million people. So the only thing is you have to agree to make your NHS electronic records available for research anonymized. Because the idea is to get bigger and bigger samples to detect smaller and smaller effects. So here are the big, one, big ones in psychiatry. Um, a lot of work has gone into severe mental disorders. Uh, this is bipolar and um, major depression, uh, depression. And with schizophrenia, you can explain seven, predict 7% 7 of the liability towards schizophrenia. Now, it's maybe 50% heritable, so it's a long way to go. But this is all just in the last few years, once we recognize that the biggest effects are very small. But the star, and the thing that's really been amazing to me, is that we use the educational attainment genome-wide association study to create polygenic scores for kids in my TEDS project, the twins project. So 7,000 kids. We create their score for educational attainment, which means years of schooling completed. Well, they're 16, so they haven't completed school, right? But we, I was interested in saying, how much of the variance will we predict in tested school achievement? And the answer is we predict 15% of the variance in school achievement, more than you predict for the target trait of educational attainment in adults, which is 10%. And this is the strongest prediction yet in the behavioral sciences, explaining 15% of the variance. School achievement 60% heritable, so we've got a long way to go. I have no doubt in a few years we'll be at 30%. It's a technical problem to get to 60%. We're going to need whole genome sequencing because the SNPs we use are great. We've got millions of them, but there's a lot of the genome we're not tagging with them. So that's the next big thing, whole genome sequencing. But right now, 15% of the variance is a lot of variance to explain. You think of Ofsted ratings of school quality explaining 4% of the variance. This is better prediction than you can make from income uh, and edu you know, SES sort of variables of the family. And I just wanted to show you this a bit more detail. If you take this correlation about 0.4, um, for the sample. Now, we take the sample now and divide the 7,000 kids into equal groups of 100 deciles. And you can see that there's a linear relationship. The y-axis is GCSE scores. You know, the, lower, the higher the polygenic score, the higher the GCSE scores. And, but there's a big difference at the extremes, even though we're only explaining 15% of the variance. The average grade of the bottom decile is a C, and the average grade of the upper decile is an A minus. But it's only 15% of the variance, so an important point to emphasize here is, I don't know if you can see the yellow dots, this is a box plot. So it means the kids in the lowest decile, 75% have a grade of C or lower. But 25% have a higher grade, and some of them have grades in the A's. It's not a perfect prediction. Conversely, the kids in the highest group, 75% have an A minus or greater, but 25% have a lower grade. But that's what will always be the case because heritability isn't 100%, so we'll never explain it all. And a real world significance even now is 25% of the kids in the lowest group go to university and 75% of those in the top group go to university. So this is a real difference and we need to think about how we're going to deal with this in education and in parenting. So right now all we've got is this course variable.
of educational attainment, but there's a lot of work being done on more specific polygenic scores for reading, for STEM subjects, and for ADHD. And I think it might help with personalized education, where we don't just have a one-size-fits-all educational system, we recognize that kids are different, and we try to go with that. Um, and if you can predict problems as in medicine, I think that will lead towards more preventative work rather than waiting until problems occur. And here's something people don't recognize. If siblings in a family are 50% similar genetically, that means they're 50% different. And people don't really r realize how different that is. So you can have kids in a family where one kid did very well at school and the other one is not doing well. But it could be they have a very different polygenic score. They, you know, it could be all over the place. You could have one that's two standard deviations above the mean and one that's two standard deviations below. And this is the thing that always comes up in education is selection. And my view, just based on values, is we shouldn't have selection. But if you do, I don't see any logical reason why you could argue against using polygenic scores to supplement tests. Because at least they're not biased. And you can't get a better score if you buy an expensive tutor, for example. So they add something to the prediction. And I'm particularly interested in the possibility that they could be useful in the most socially disadvantaged families, where the kids don't have the Liebensfeld to deal with academic you know, um, training. So what I've tried to say is that inherited DNA differences are the major systematic force making us who we are, d uh, making our children, d uh, d being responsible for how our children do at school. The environment's important, but it's not systematic. It's this, these random chance variables, not systematic effects of families or schools. And that polygenic scores will transform si science. It's already happening. All big studies now are including DNA to add a genetic component to what they're doing. Society, parenting, schools, and also how we understand ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. We do have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, please wait for the microphone. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so on the genome-wide association studies, you mentioned that um, these are correlational, but that generally implies causation. And it's true there's no reverse causation here. But don't things like assortative mating uh, increase those bias those estimates upward? And I guess the extreme case would be you could imagine a genome-wide association study that would test for country of birth, yeah. right? Like, and it's yeah. implausible that genetics would have yeah. impact. Yeah. Well, this is you know like condensed from three hours of talk, and it's discussed in the book. That this very good point that as I said at the beginning, we only describe particular populations at particular times. And the populations that are in these big genome-wide association studies are almost entirely Northern European, American, Australian, they're Caucasian populations. So these scores describe that population pretty well. So it describes people in England, but it doesn't describe other ancestry groups, for example. And the way you deal with this is you, you take out principal components from these analyses. So these, these are the, you know, this is all the life sciences doing this stuff and it's some of the brightest people around. So that's well covered. The issue of assortative mating is a tricky one um, because we're, if you're interested in predicting how well kids do at school, part of their genetics is whether or not there's assortative mating. You know, like begets like, opposites attract, uh-uh. It's only like begets like. It's assortative, positive assortative mating. So, you know, if you don't believe in intelligence, be single, go to a, um, a singles bar, and in a few minutes, the first thing you're picking up is how bright someone is, especially verbal intelligence. So for personality, the correlation is 0.1 between spouses. For um, nonverbal ability, it's 0.4, and for verbal ability, it's 0.6. I mean, you don't really know somebody's spatial ability very well when you talk to them, but you very quickly pick up on whether they're going to be worth talking to in the morning. So that's a sort of mating. And it's part of the genetics. It's getting at mechanisms. If you want to understand the mechanisms by which this occurs, great. But if you're interested in prediction, it's okay, assortative mating. And it, and it really is only for cognitive abilities that you get this assortative mating. It's a great question, and there's you know, tons of stuff about this. And so it'd be nice to be able to go on about it some more. But I think we'll have to leave it there for this. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. So
um, in the study about uh, polygenic scores and essentially the effect sizes, if you have a million people and you have a lot of SNPs, how can you like detect the effects and like interactions between different small size, like yeah, small effect sizes? Great question. I'll repeat it because that mic is only for the recording. Um, is a question about if you have these small effects, how do you correct for looking at millions of SNPs? And the second part was essentially. The, if, you, if you consider interactions between small effects, ah, yeah. right? Interactive effects. So, um, again, a lot to say about that. That's a very pertinent question. Um, but as I showed you, we're correcting for a million tests. So that line of significance corrects for a million tests, even though you have more than a million SNPs. Those are linkage groups. So it's thought that a million, correcting for a million tests work, and it does. Because what you do is you create these polygenic scores from the genome-wide association data in one study, but then you apply them in independent samples. And what people realize right away is if you take 100 SNPs, it doesn't predict nearly as well as 1,000, doesn't predict nearly as well in independent samples as 10,000. But as you rightly are intuiting, these are additive effects of each SNP. And most people think genetic effects must interact. Well, they do at a mechanistic level, but fortunately for us, they don't when it comes to adding up the effects of genes. You get most of the effect of heritability from adding up these genes. And in a way, that's the way selection works in evolution. It works on additive genetic variants. But you know, it's hard to believe, but quantitative genetic studies, twin and adoption studies, and animal selection studies are all consistent with the notion that, that genetic effects are largely additive because the problems of power would be so much greater if you have to deal with not just interactions between two genes, but what about 10 genes or 100 genes? Uh, th thank you for the talk. Um, I, I'm a physicist by training, so I have to ask some of the, so if I try always to look at some of the more fundamental perspectives. So if I understand correctly, DNA uh, determines what proteins are produced by the body, which means that if we inject those proteins which make people, in quotes, smarter, then that, that study potentially, you know, this study could be potentially interpreted like, you know, today you, you can do a test, even in the UK, um, for uh, before the child is, bur is born for ge uh, severe genetic disorders and potentially terminate the, the pregnancy early. Um, and uh, one can imagine that some people won't want sort of uh, kids which have predisposed to be uh, less uh, performant at school. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, these studies could be interpreted as um, you know, a, a way to develop medicines which um, uh, make people's cognitive abilities higher. Um, do, do, mm -hmm. does, does it make sense? Yeah, so you started off by saying you know, about you're talking about single gene, simple gene, protein, sort of relationships. And it's all a lot more complicated. All these genes do many, many different things. And each thing, even in the brain, is influenced by many, many genes. So it's going to be hard to take like a gene editing approach for these complex disorders and traits influenced by thousands of DNA differences. Where people are really thinking about it, though, is in terms of single gene disorders. That's where gene editing comes in. But you know, you have, there was this crazy BBC documentary on beauty and how we could do gene editing for beauty. But you see, you've got trillions of cells. How are you going to change all of your cells as an adult? All you can do with gene editing is get in there at the first stages, but you'd have to change every cell. But people are trying to do that you know, for single gene disorders with gene editing, this CRISPR technology, which is amazing. But I don't think it's going to work when you're dealing with these thousands of tiny DNA differences. But another good question. For one more question. No one has one. We can finish here. So thanks a lot again. My pleasure. Thank you all.